Welcome back to the SWAT, my friends, and welcome if you are new. Today we're going to do something a little bit new in the swamp. It's been a while since we tackled a somewhat new topic. Today we're going to travel over to the European forest and see what we can find in the depths of those woods. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share, be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. You can also submit them on reddit at r slash the dark swamp. I'd love to share your story with everyone here. Now, be sure to hit that like button, subscribe if you're new, and get ready for these creepy and downright strange European forest horror stories. My Hiking Nightmare in Germany by Content Ground Hiking alone has been a source of solace for me. The woods with their towering trees and whispering leaves feel like a sanctuary, a place where I can truly unwind and connect with nature. But one particular hike near the French border in Germany turned into an experience I can neither fully explain nor forget. It was a scorching summer day, and I was already on my way back from a long hike. The sun beat down relentlessly, and the air was thick with the scent of pine and earth. As I trudged along the narrow, winding path, a sign caught my eye. It announced a small spring just 200 meters to the left, a spot used for Christian pilgrimage back in the day. They were rebuilt after the famous grottoes back in the day. Intrigued and eager for a break, I decided to check it out. The path to the spring was overgrown but inviting, shaded by a canopy of ancient looking trees. As I approached, I spotted a roebuck gracefully drinking from the water that trickled naturally from a small moss covered grotto. The sight was serene, almost magical. I sat down by the edge of the spring, letting the cool water refresh my neck and cheeks. The chill was a welcome relief from the oppressive heat, but I was careful not to drink any of the water. After a few minutes of peaceful rest, I stood up, ready to tackle the last stretch back to my car. That's when everything changed. The forest, which had felt so tranquil moments before, suddenly seemed to shift. An instinctive feeling of imminent danger washed over me, making my heart pound in my chest. I strained my ears and heard a sound, a deep, resonant voice speaking in a strange ancient language. It seemed to emanate from the trees themselves. A sense of urgency gripped me, and I began to walk faster, my senses on high alert. Suddenly, the forest came alive with the sounds of hasty footsteps all around me. They echoed from behind, from above in the trees, like a dozen small creatures were chasing me. Shadows fitted between the trees, but no matter how hard I tried to focus, I could not see what was making the noises. Panic began to set in, and I broke into a run, stumbling over gnarled roots and uneven ground. Minutes felt like hours as I fled the small water grotto, quickly disappearing from view. Just as I thought I couldn't run any further, I heard a deep female voice. It spoke calmly, uttering a few words in an ancient language from somewhere to the left of the track, behind a large weathered rock. Then, as suddenly as it begun, everything just stopped. In the blink of an eye, the forest returned to its normal state. The birds resumed their singing, and a peaceful calm settled over the woods once more, breathing heavily. I slowed my pace and looked around. Everything appeared as it had before, but I knew something had changed. To this day I have no logical explanation for what happened. Maybe it was just my imagination, a result of the heat and exhaustion playing tricks on me, or perhaps it was something more. A glimpse into the ancient past of these woods, a place where Christian and Celto-Germanic histories intertwined, leaving behind echoes of an old magic and forgotten rituals. The Special Rabbit by Seraphim It was the early 1940s, a time when the world was at war. 
but in the rural heart of Macedonia, life moved to the timeless rhythm of the seasons. My grandmother, just a young girl at the time, was riding a horse alongside her uncle, heading to a nearby village to visit relatives. The path they took wound through a dense ancient forest with a canopy of leaves filtered the sunlight in it like a soft green glow. The forest was alive with nature's sounds, the chirping of birds, the rustling of leaves, and the occasional snap of a twig underfoot. Suddenly, a rabbit bolted across their path. The horse started to have weird jerky movements because of it, reared up on its hind legs and neighing in a panic. My grandmother clung to the horse's mane, her heart pounding in her chest. Her uncle struggled to calm the frightened animal, speaking soothing words and gently pulling on the reins. As the horse slowly began to calm down and come back to some sense of normalcy, the rabbit stopped just a few feet away and turned to face them. To their astonishment, the rabbit did something entirely unnatural. It, it grinned. Not just any grin, but a wide, unsettling smile that seemed almost inhuman. It then emitted a strange giggling sound, a sound that echoed eerily in the quiet forest. The horse snorted and stamped its feet, still nervous but no longer panicking. My grandmother, as an only child of a priest, was deeply superstitious. The rabbit's bizarre behavior terrified her and she clung to her uncle who was equally disturbed but tried to remain composed. The rabbit, after what felt like an eternity, finally turned around and continued on its way, disappearing into the underbrush as if nothing unusual had ever happened. The forest slowly returned to its normal state, but the memory of that unsettling encounter, the fear, and the lingering sense of the supernatural haunted them both. Years later, my grandma would recount this story, her eyes wide with the same fear she felt that day. To her, it was a clear sign of encountering something otherworldly, something malevolent. She believed that the rabbit was a manifestation of the devil himself, a belief that was reinforced by the superstition and folklore of her upbringing. He Met the Devil by Sizel in the heart of Eastern Europe, nestled between rolling hills and dense ancient forests, lay a small village. The villagers lived simple lives, often reliant on the bounty of the surrounding nature. Among them was my great-grandfather, a sturdy man known for his strong work ethic and resolve. His family, like many others, sometimes had to bend the rules to make ends meet. One cold, moonless night, my great-grandfather decided to venture into the forest to gather some wood. It was a risky endeavor, as taking wood from the forest was strictly forbidden. The authorities were vigilant, and the penalties were severe. Nonetheless, the need to keep his family warm during the harsh winter outweighed his fear of getting caught. As he carefully navigated the dense underbrush, he unexpectedly stumbled upon another villager. It was somebody who knew, somebody by the name of Ivan, a neighbor with a similar predicament. Their shared goal forged an unspoken bond, and they decided to stick together for safety and camaraderie. Time slowly passed by in the quiet, eerie forest. The only sounds were the crunching of leaves underfoot and the occasional hoot of an owl. Suddenly, they caught sight of a small figure in the darkness. Approaching cautiously, they realized it was a billy goat. Its fur was black as the night itself. Someone must have lost their goat, my great-grandfather murmured, his voice barely a whisper. Ivan nodded in agreement. The thought of fresh meat was too tempting to pass up. They decided to take the billy goat with them, planning to share its meat at a later date. They carefully placed the goat in a large sack. Almost immediately, the sack began to feel heavier. At first, they thought it was just their imagination. But as they trudged through the forest, the weight became more and more burdensome. They had to stop frequently exchanging the sack between them. Why is this goat so heavy? Ivan grunted, wiping sweat away from his brow despite the cold night air. As they continued, the goat inside the sack grew increasingly more restless. 
it thrashed and kicked, making it harder for them to carry. Finally, my great-grandfather, exasperated, muttered, Take it easy, Billy Goat. To their utter horror, a strange voice echoed back from the sack, repeating this exact word. Take it easy, Billy Goat. They froze, their blood running cold. My great-grandfather's hand instinctively went to the gun at his waist. With trembling fingers, he drew it and fired twice into the sack. The shots echoed through the forest, and then there was silence. Cautiously, they opened the sack, expecting to see the lifeless body of the goat. But to their astonishment, there was nothing inside, just thin air. The goat had vanished without a trace. The two men stood there, bewildered and terrified. The weight of their actions and the supernatural encounter left them shaken to their core. They were convinced that they had encountered the devil himself, a punishment for their intent to steal. Word of their harrowing experience spread quickly through the forest. It became a tale of caution, a reminder of the thin line between survival and morality, and the mysterious forces that lurked in the shadows of the ancient forests around them. The Mountains of Norway by Dangleberries There's this mountain hotel in northern Norway I often go with my family and such. Someone I am related to is the leader or owner of it or something, and my entire family usually goes there for Easter and other holidays. It's located in the middle of nowhere, so it's like an hour and it takes like snowmobile and all kinds of other vehicles to get there. It's located on a very old Sami ground. Samis are the indigenous people of Northern Europe or something of the sort, very spiritual people. The hotel and cabin thing was 11 rooms in total and outside there was this old burn which was the aggregate. The four rooms closest to the barn is said to be the oldest. I'll start with some of the less scary stories until the grand finale. I have not experienced any of these myself even though I have experienced very minor shady stuff there. The first story comes from my cousin. My cousin was out by the toilet door, which was an outhouse, taking a pee in the snow. When he saw another cousin go into the barn, probably to go get wood for the oven. So when he was done using the bathroom, he decides he's gonna scare him and go to the other entrance and sneak through the long hallway. He notices that my other cousin isn't there anymore, so he thinks maybe he just didn't really see him. He rushes up to go boo around the corner, maybe thinking that he just wasn't seeing him right, but when he jumps in, there was nobody there, at all, and there's no way he could have walked by without him noticing. The second story comes from an old friend of mine. He was there with his classmates, and they had, you know, that one girl who was completely silent, always weird, and it was always hard to get her to talk, and he had personally never heard her say a word before. Randomly, out of nowhere, as they were walking by that same area we had just talked about, she started screaming really loud and crying hysterically. She was alone just for like half a second and instantly burst into tears. She said, that there was some sort of imaginary figure that we couldn't see behind her, brushing her hair, and it was some sort of old man in the mirror behind her. The third story is when there was a man that I met who told me about one time when he was there alone with his dog. They slept in the room closest to the living room. In the middle of the night, they heard something that sounded like a same ceremony, and some sort of dancing and man-made drums. He said he heard a lot of weird stuff. It sounded like there was a whole party or ceremony going on. The dog was staring at the wall with his ears pointed up the whole night, and he said he didn't sleep a wink. The fourth story, there was a family that was there alone for a weekend. They were just camping and enjoying the time, when they heard a woman moaning and crying out in the woods. By the way, this is very far from anybody, I'm pretty sure I explained, so there should be nobody out there. The next day, they actually found out that a woman died in the parking area, and she had been there for quite a few weeks before they even got there, so maybe they heard her spirit weeping. This last story is one that I had heard from many different people over the years. 
They all had the same details, though, and that's why I believe it. There was a 10th grade class who went there in the summer. At nighttime, some of the guys were sitting there and talking next to the window. This room is closest to the barn and to the woods. Two guys were talking by the window, and one guy was trying to sleep, until they heard this girl moan really painfully. In my friend's words, it was as if she was getting assaulted. He said, the sound was extremely loud and startling, like something he had never heard before, but he seemingly instantly felt he knew it was somebody in trouble. They instantly got up and ran outside down towards the lake down a small hill. They didn't see anybody, but they could hear noises, and they seemed to be coming from deep within the woods across the lake. They were all freaked out about it. They all reported it, but nothing really ever seemed to happen. I'm not sure what was going on, and none of us are really sure what's going on in this area. But those cabins, those woods, that whole nature preserve, there's something wrong with it. I went on vacation in Northern Europe with my grandfather, as he had taken people there before. When I left the States, I did some research on the mythicism of the people. A generous preponderance of it was concerning trolls, and so I did an expansive investigation touching on the topic of trolls. I listened to the podcast of Swamp Dweller and others. Anyway, my grandfather was remarkably kind and when I requested to investigate Troller's Gill, he granted it without equivocation. We had countless fun experiences while in the United Kingdom. Resting in peace, Grandpa. Anyhow, on the route to Apple Treewick, we stopped at Tesco Petrol Station. We convened a couple of quite charming chaps there, one appearing to be somewhere in their mid-thirties, and the other looking somewhere in his sixties. The more youthful fellow had ginger hair and was wearing a corduroy parka. The mature individual possessed a full head of lustrous silver hair and had an extremely crisp Norwegian accent. They inquired where we were going. I simply replied, Troller's Gill. The more adult one shifted to the ginger and his peepers went wide. The redhead discerned that he was surprised that we would be going there and his eyes went wide. The pair then both stared at me and my grandpa with shock. The old guy said something about a dog beast in German, and the other looked to my grandfather and declared, Troller's gill is shamed for the devil dog brute. Anyone who beholds him perishes shortly after. We both presumed he was ribbing, and I understand it seems cliche, but I was honestly sort of creeped out. But I downed a strawberry Miranda in the truck, which set me in a kindred spirit. Once we arrived, I spontaneously sensed an uncomfortable, eerie presence. The presence of an omnipotent presence. We advanced along the path, and I began to overhear some echoing, clanging clamors up ahead. We continued moving along and hiked up to the summit of a large hill. We sat there and let dew soak into the rear of our trousers, and snacked on granola, taking occasional swigs of our Red Bull. We took in the view of the Grand Chasm, and the fragrance of moist earth moss, and fungi. We inhaled with contentment. The light, barely lucid fog sent along with the essence of stone and cold rain. The tempestuous, storm clouds refined the sunlight of the setting day star through themselves, tinting the cumulus bodies of deep, brilliant azure. My sagacious grandfather understood and discerned this to be the mark of dusk and clarified to me that it was growing late. We did not possess any watches amidst us, or any device concerning time for that matter. We had left them behind in the truck as a way to get away from those things. We coveted the lavish impact of this sight I had been so eager to experience. We just hunkered down there for a few more moments. We both grasped the truth that we ought to leave shortly, but we both wordlessly chose to relax there for just a few more minutes. My stare trailed up from the crevice up to the elegant sky. As I was mounting up the resolution to indicate that we had to get on our way, my prepubescent brain did not want to leave. As I transcribe this, I realize that it presumably had to do with the pubescence and more of the repugnant entity toying around amidst my subconsciousness. While we irrevocably got up and started preparing to leave, we both heard what sounded like a howling. 
We both gazed down into the crevice and then overheard a hushed growl much closer to our position. I peered into the mysterious chasm, the surging, writhing umbra taunting me, spurring my hormone-ridden cerebrum. I was frozen in terror. I underwent profound coercion to attend my grandfather, and the moment I did, he cried out in fear. He pointed down to the gorge, and I looked downhill. I didn't detect anything, yet still, the petty child within me was even more panicked as I observed my tough old grandpa getting that frightened, and not being there for him. Nearly simultaneously, my grandpa and I bolted, and at that instant, it seemed like he was running quicker than me. As we ran along the trail, the clinking and clanking accompanied us at a comfortable pace, almost like the beast was tantalizing us. Now, tears began streaming down my face, seemingly burning my cheeks. I glanced at my grandpa, and he glanced at me. We were both scared out of our wits. We made it to the security of our truck. My soft weeping drastically converted into heavy sobbing. Once I was done with my tearful sitting, the flesh below my eyes was stinging so sorely that I felt like a weeping anew. According to my grandfather, there were amazingly extrinsic tear streaks under my eyes, a dull maroon edge on a formless path, the body of the line paler than my skin hue. When I spoke to him regarding our encounter, I inquired about what he was pointing at in the gloomy chasm. He told me these exact words and I quote, a dark furred wolf as heavy as a bear with tusk like a hog and fangs like a viper, his eyes. His eyes were broad saucers charged with fire and his embers stung me. As he uttered this description to me, it was almost idyllic. For some reason, his words had an immeasurable effect on me. I don't have a photogenic memory but for some reason I can recite the complete bit off the top of my head every single time with no consideration or hesitation, like the place had a lasting mark on me. I might go back there someday. I can't grasp what I will do. There were only two material things I took home with me from that monster, but you surely couldn't label it as evidence. A tear in my beloved sweater, now I normally go with the flow, but for some reason it made my heart stop. I suddenly broke into a cold sweat. I originally noticed it when I was on the way back. I was tensely fiddling with the finger breath of my attire. It was dark at this point, and I was doing everything I could to hold my gaze away from the ditches on the side of the road. My imagination was waiting for me there, with a knife behind its back. I sensed something burning me, and I tore my hand away from the sweater. I noticed a tear, and I somehow associated it that it was ripped with teeth. Not hominid teeth, but something sharper. My grandfather didn't discern my pain. It was dark, and he was concentrating on more significant matters like driving. The other item was driven into the sole of my shoe, a rusted black link from a chain. I don't understand the importance of this article, but I believe there is something peculiar concerning it. Thank you, Swamp, for sharing my story if you do. Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true, downright strange European deep woods horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, whether it's a story from Europe, from the United States, from the woods, from the beach, anywhere out in the great outdoors, be sure to send it on in at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I would love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to hit that like button, as the more likes this episode gets, the more YouTube promotes it, and that helps the swamp grow its ever-expanding waters. If you're on the go, but don't have YouTube Premium, but still want to download and listen to your favorite Swamp Dweller scary stories no matter where you are, you can download them absolutely free from Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcast, and pretty much everywhere else you find your favorite podcast online. Thank you guys so, so much for supporting the swamp the way you do. Remember, if you're new here, to be sure to subscribe and turn on those notifications so you don't miss a new episode as I upload them multiple times a week on all things natural and supernatural. 
Be sure to comment down below what story was your favorite. It helps me pick better stories and I love seeing your reviews. I'll see you guys soon with another creepy episode.